I feel a little bit of a fish out of water because um, I'm not actually uh, a methodologist thinking about democratising research methods. That's not my, the kind of focus of my work. But the focus of my day-to-day -day work is actually on the question of citizen participation in political decision making. What Graham didn't mention is that we were colleagues for almost a decade and a half, uh, one floor apart, he was in sociology, I was in uh, politics, and um, we would kind of grab these conversations every so often about democracy and about how we were looking at it. And one of the things that Graham thought would be worthwhile, you'll have to decide whether he was right, was for me to talk about some of the problems that we find in the field of citizen participation in political decision making and whether there are lessons to be learned for researchers wanting to use democratic, more democratic methods. I hope that makes some sense. So what I'm actually going to be talking about is what we know from my field about trying to, uh, trying to engage citizens in participatory political decision making and then occasionally making reference to, oh, that might be the similar kind of problem you have in, uh, in democratising research methods. So, it's a slightly tangential, but um, I, hope it, I hope it bears some, some fruit. So I'm just going to put these up as bold statements. Um, this is kind of from my field. Uh, and these are contested, contested statements. Each one of them we could spend 20 minutes on. But it kind of gives you a sense of where, I, of where, of where my work is and where people are thinking. And I think you could probably put democratising research methods instead of it in here. So the first is that democracy as an ideal demand citizen participation, um, and there are debates about that within democratic theory, about how much. Uh, citizens have the capacity to participate in the critical decisions that affect their lives, as you can imagine. A lot of empirical work in political science done on that. And that th this is the area I do most work, about democratic institutions can or should, in fact, be designed to enable that participation. That participation doesn't happen by chance, and in the same way that you're thinking about uh, research methods to democratise. You've got the design question, how do you do that? So a lot of work was being done on the first two for many years and only recently, it sounds bizarre, but only recently has the Academy actually thought hey, we should think about this question of design. And my sense of engaging as I do you know, uh, on the edges of the democratisation social, of social research agenda is actually that design question is absolutely key. So the area of work that I'm involved in is typically referred to as democratic innovation. I'm not happy about the title. It was a title of a book I wrote that seems to have caught on because innovation can happen all, all over the place, not just in terms of citizen participation. So it's, a, it's not the best term. But when we work in this area, we're thinking about institutions that have been explicitly designed to increase and deepen citizen participation in the political decision-making process. Again, I think we could just say, let's swap that for in terms of research methodology. This is trying to engage citizens qua citizens rather than representatives of organised interests. It's institutionalised in the sense it has some, it at least is intended to have some political effect and it departs from the traditional ways that we tend to do things. And I've given you a couple of examples of the sorts of things I'm talking about. These are the kind of sceptical voices you get in response to this agenda and I imagine they are the sorts of, well I know they're the sorts of sceptical voices you get in, re in relation to democratising um, social science methodology. You know, it will be the usual suspects who you'll engage, there will be no impact on the actual end, end, end product, uh, citizens don't know enough to do it, but it's too expensive, too time consuming and people won't want to do it. So I wasn't sure how to frame this. About a couple of two or three weeks ago, I got in touch with Graham and I said, why exactly did you invite me to this conference? And so he sent me this email and I thought, actually, no, I'm going to frame this. And actually, this is a birthday. It's, it's Graham's birthday today, by the way. So this is my birthday present to you, Graham. I'm responding directly to your email. So <laughs> I know Graham would like that as a birthday present. So that's, you know, that's good. So um, you've had work. <laughs> so his questions were, and these aren't, you know, how representative is the, are the kinds of institutions that you work with? What's the kind of quality of what comes out of them? And what's the impact? So I took those as my kind of framing, and I thought what I'll do is I'm going to talk to you, and I think this is an interesting strategy which we can talk about as well. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of exemplary cases, and then I'm going to make some general comments. comments. So the first of you, if, you're, if you work in this area, I apologise, kind of, these are sort of chestnuts of my area, but I think they're really interesting, interesting cases. The first is participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre, and the second is a citizens' assembly that was run in British Columbia. I'm going to go through these quite quickly, the slides are available. So in Porto Alegre, they involve um, tens of thousands of citizens every year in decision making about um, over £150 million of capital budget. 
every year. And what's really striking about Porto Alegre is they get significant involvement from poor neighbourhoods. And the structure has been such that we've seen a redistribution of resources to projects in those poorer neighbourhoods. And part of this is about how the institution has been designed. Um, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but you have popular assemblies where anyone can, can put forward proposals for, in, in, put forward proposals for um, developments in their area. They then elect representatives who go on this regional budget forums and they prioritise them. And the really clever thing about this is they have a separate institution which decides what are the rules of distribution going to be. And they have a very clever way of selecting people so no area can dominate and they tend to come up with rules which promote social justice, hence you get this distribution to the poor. And the really interesting thing about this is that it creates clear incentives to participate. People can see a relationship between their actual participation and the outcomes of that participation. There's a clear division of labour, it doesn't require everybody to participate all the time, some people put themselves forward to do more work than others. No single group can dominate the rulemaking institutions. There's really active community organisation in order to bring forward people who wouldn't normally participate. And most importantly, there's a demonstration effect. The bureaucracy has been reorganised in that city to ensure they deliver the things that have been decided. So there's a really interesting way of just saying, we're not just going to have participation for participation's sake, we're actually going to structure it in a very clever way. British Columbia did something in, uh, completely different. There was political gridlock about, where everyone knew which they should change their electoral system, but no one knew what they should do. Um, each of the political parties had its own view, as you can imagine, which would give advantage to that party. So what they did is they handed decision-making power to a citizens' assembly, and then the decision was that, that assembly would be put to a referendum. Um, 160 randomly selected citizens, two from each um, electoral district and two Aboriginal members, worked for 11 months on should there be a new electoral system and what should it be. They had deliberation phases, sorry, education phases, consultation phases, deliberation phases and decision making phases. And they made a recommendation that it should change to STV. That went out to a vote. Um, 75 out of 77 districts in the, said they would do it, should do it. It was close to a 60% vote. Unfortunately, the government had put a 60% vote threshold. So we've actually got, I would say, quite resounding support for this, but it was a super majority requirement. And one of the problems where it was there was it lacked, it lacked publicity. But the interesting thing is they did it. And these citizens stuck with it. They'd been, uh, they, they'd been uh, brought forward through a random selection process. And this is kind of a classic democratic process which we tend to ignore. This, this kind of idea of random selection means that no social group is systematically excluded. It shows that... It, it, Plenty of evidence that formal invitation, actually asking people to participate, sending out invitations once people had been selected, is a really powerful incentive. Um, and it showed you can design institutions where there's an unambiguous relationship between citizen participation and the legislative process. And I guess the corollary of that is can you have an unambiguous relationship between the research process and the research outputs? So, answering Graham's big questions. Firstly, the representative question, which is basically, is it the usual suspects? Now, I've just given you two cases of extremely significant political institutions where it certainly wasn't the usual suspects and that they were designed specifically such that it wouldn't be. The first one such that the kinds of incentives within the design were ones that would ensure that the poorest and the most political marginalised in Porto Alegre would engage. Excuse me. The second, using the technique of random selection as a way of selecting your, part your participants as a way of ensuring that you didn't get the sort of uh, continuation of sort of systematic differentiation across social groups. So the first question, Graham, is yes, you can design. There you go, that's first, my first part of my birthday present. <laughs> Second, quality. What can we learn? I mean, does it help having inverted commas? And he did put it in inverted commas, non-expert, so you know, it wasn't uh, his, uh, you know, this is the, 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 the language of the field, if you like. Certainly in Porto, these are very, very different institutions doing very, very different things. In Porto Alegre, what was important was the, the bureaucracy, the, 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 bu the bureaucracy and the political leadership knew it didn't understand the nature of all the local problems. 
So a bureaucrat sitting in Porto Alegre Town Hall didn't really know what the priorities should be. There were so many things that could be done and so many interests that wanted to do things. So actually what the design creates is a, a framework within which local knowledge can become part of the demand making process. And secondly, when citizens are given the chance to deliberate about what the rules of the game were, they came up with social justice criteria, i.e. the distribution should be based on need. Which was very different from the kind of, one of the reasons PB was put in was to uh, kind of under, uh, undermine the corruption and the clientelism within the city. And it completely changed the way the rules of the game in budget, in budget redistribution. In British Columbia, there was significant investment ensuring that in fact, they, they pretty much did electoral systems 101, <laughs> you know, kind of the first year course on electoral systems that you get in a politics degree. And that, that's, what the, that's what these citizens did. They learned about electoral form, they deliberated. And what I found particularly interesting in the literature on this and in discussions with people is that experts, as in um, electoral systems experts and political uh, actors, did not agree with their decision. So the citizens came up with a very different decision than most of the electoral systems and political acts, but each of those groups understood why the citizens had made that decision and they had a different value set basically. What was important to them from an electoral system was very different from what an academic would prioritise and what a political elite, someone from the political elite would prioritise. So it was a well-reasoned decision. So that's an interesting, interesting finding in itself. That using this method actually came up with a very different proposal than would normally come up, come up from traditional systems. So, and the third question that Graham had was so, the so what question, what impact did these things have? Well in Porto Alegre it means the redistribution of significant parts of the capital budget. I mean there is, you know, we see investment in roads and infrastructure in areas which wouldn't have seen it. Um, as I say, it, it has reversed investment priorities. With British Columbia Assembly, their decision was linked to a final referendum. That referendum, as I say, didn't win for various, uh, I, I would say for, you know, sort of quite, you know, because of the supermajority requirement, but there was a clear relationship between the work of that assembly and the final political decision. And so this is, sorry, this is a, a bit of self-publicity, publicity. Um, but this come, this, these, these cases come from a book which I wrote called Democratic Innovations, and one of the key analytical points made in that, as I look through these different innovations, there's a whole series of others, I just pulled two out, is that there are different goods if you're a democratic, if you're interested in democracy, if you're interested in democratic participation, there are um, a series of goods that you would like to see um, achieved. Uh, inclusiveness, popular control, considered judgment and publicity were the four I chose. And what I, what I came to realise as I looked across this range of institutions was that no one institution can realise all of those four goods. We've actually got a problem of institution. No one institution on its own can realise any of those four goods. And I have a feeling the same kind of trick is going to be true about the democratisation of research methods. That you're going to have to decide which of these various goods you, need, you are trying to realise because no one method will allow you to realise all of these goods. In fact, you might have to think about sequencing methods, you might have to think about having methods in parallel with each other, but certainly the lesson from, from politics, from political science, is there is no one, kill, no one silver bullet which is going to give you all of the different goods that you might want to achieve. I think that's, an, personally, I mean, I would say this because it was my, my way of approaching, I think that's a nice way of approaching this kind of field, thinking about which part of the democratic, what aspect of democratic goods are we trying to realise through doing this? And don't think that you're going to be able to realise everything and be explicit about that. So I've just given you exemplary institutions. That's actually a really poor research method in itself. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rhetorical strategy. If I actually go beyond PB in Brazil or I go beyond many publics that have happened in BCCA, the results are much more mixed. Too often participatory governance is the things that Graham is worried about, too often it is unrepresentative, too often it's poor quality, and too often it's little impact. And I was going to say it's a bit like most participatory research, probably. Um, and I think the interesting thing here that I would say is there are enough instances of when it works to show that it can work. But there are so many instances of it not working which potentially undermine the field. One of the real problems for us working in this field is that, um, is that when we're trying to persuade um, political elites and others to take these kind of ideas on board, there's plenty of evidence to show 
that if it does, isn't done properly, it doesn't work very well. There's another report which I was involved in um, for the Power Inquiry in the UK where we tried to understand why this was the case. Um, and I've got a whole series of things here which we could talk about, but these resonate, I think, with researchers. Um, a climate of compulsion funding criteria. I'll do something demo democratic because it's the kind of thing that the funders like. Well, that may not actually lead to, to good research methods. Being clear about aims of participation and, the, and, and what uh, the, the last presentation was talking about, a lack of trust and scepticism. Interestingly, a lack of trust and scepticism by citizens of political elites, but a scepticism of political elites, read perhaps the academy, of citizens and their capacities. So I think there's some really interesting resonances here. I'm just going to finish with a very just quick, quick advertisement for a particular project I'm involved in, and also just to give this as an example of this trying to do so more participatory research. This is Participedia. It's a um, online forum, uh, an online platform trying to collect examples of the democratic innovations I was talking to you about from all around the world. One of the problems we have is that um, the knowledge in this field is highly dispersed. You've got lots of different research groups working on it. You've got lots of public authorities doing experiments. You've got civil society practitioners and activists actually running these things and no clearinghouse. So we thought, as in a bunch of academics and some, and some civil society activists, we thought we would create this um, platform on which people could upload materials and if you notice here, oh, here we, here we go. And within it, we would actually be able to capture some sort of quantitative data about it. And we'd also have uh, text which we could analyze uh, and generate these quite large uh, data sets, etc. cetera. Um, what's been really interesting about that is we are a bunch of uh, supposedly people working on democratic engagement, but we haven't worked out quite how to get the incentives right in terms of engaging these different communities. It is extremely hard. And I think that's one of the lessons that I've come away with from this, um, from this uh, field, is that new technology gives us all sorts of opportunities. There is a kind of un over an, an argument, a, a, a sort of undeniable argument that it would be great to collect data in this way. But then a couple of questions pop up. One, what's the quality of that data once we've got it? I mean, it's a Wikipedia kind of um, uh, affair, but you know, is, is it, should, I, should I trust that? or not. Um, and secondly, although everybody buys into the concept, not everyone feels they've got time to do it. So there's a kind of, yes, we should do this democratisation of the process, but actually it's really hard to get the incentives right. It's really hard to motivate the different actors involved in, who have an interest in this project. And I think that again is a real problem for this field of democratising social research is, can we get the incentives right such that what we're doing is representative such that what we're doing has quality and such that what we're doing has impact. So thank you very much.